By now, you've probably heard the popular TV show that portrays the Cordyceps fungus infecting humans and turning them into zombie-like creatures. But let me tell you, the real-life scenario is much more terrifying. I work in a lab that specializes in plant and fungi experimentation. Our primary focus is on developing new drugs for the pharmaceutical industry, including everything from anti-aging remedies to creating the next blue pill. However, we also received significant funding from the Defense Department, and their research requirements are much more sinister. How are the new test subjects doing? Steven, our lab supervisor, asked as he approached me carrying a clipboard. He gestured towards the eight test rooms in front of us. Number four looks promising, and I think six and seven are starting to show signs, I said, looking up from my workstation. Inside the eight test rooms were five men and two women, one in each room, plus a single empty room. It was left empty after a rogue chimpanzee from the earlier phase experiments had managed to escape its cage and break the pass-through window, which is used to transfer materials and instruments between sterile and non-sterile rooms. Steven nodded, a look of excitement on his face. Excellent. We're getting closer. In the cages, test subjects 1, 2, 3, and 5 appeared to be behaving somewhat normally, pacing their small 8x8 eight eight cage or talking to themselves. However, test subject 4 had remained motionless now for about two hours. Lying on his side with his back to us, his chest rising and falling his only movement. Meanwhile, test subjects 6 and 7 had recently become lethargic, barely responding to the electric shocks administered to their enclosure. All of the test subjects had been exposed to a variety of chemically altered cordyceps fungus. Typically, cordyceps cannot infect humans due to our higher internal temperatures among other factors. However, by modifying the fungus's genetic makeup, we were close to changing that. Let's keep a close eye on those three. Report back to me if there are any updates. Will do, I replied. With that, Stephen left the room and I returned to monitoring the test subject's vitals on the screen. Interestingly, subjects 4, 6, and 7 had significantly elevated heart rates, almost 50% higher than the others. Additionally, their endorphin levels, the body's natural painkillers, were unusually high, indicating that they were experiencing intense pain, despite showing none of the typical outward signs. What do you make of this? I asked my lab partner Mike while pointing to the screen with my pen. He looked over the vitals on my screen. It looks like they are in intense pain. Those sorts of levels would be what I would expect to see if someone were on fire. He said dryly. Yeah, that's what it looks like to me as well, I replied. Our test subjects were some of the worst criminals our government had locked up. The advantage of working for the Defense Department, especially where we required human subjects, was there was no shortage of forgotten criminals, terrorists, murderers, or other violent offenders. These individuals were typically housed in maximum security prisons and were serving lengthy sentences, often for life. While the use of human subjects in scientific experiments is controversial and subject to strict ethical guidelines, the Defense Department saw the need to conduct these tests outside the normal guidelines. Therefore, the rules no longer applied, and we had the green light to do whatever we needed to get the results. Let's do a blood test and see if the troponin levels have increased on subjects 6, 4, and 7, I said to Mike. Mike nodded and left his seat to get dressed in his hazmat suit. With the heart rate and endorphin levels so extremely elevated, I thought it could be possible that the cordyceps is already spreading through the test subjects, paralyzing them while simultaneously causing immense pain. If my theory was right, then not only will we have successfully managed to infect the first human ever with cordyceps, but it would have taken effect within three hours of exposure. Cordyceps is a type of parasitic fungus that primarily infects ants as well as other insects such as beetles and caterpillars. The infection process begins when a spore of the cordyceps fungus lands on the exoskeleton of an ant. 
Once the spore is attached to the ant, it begins to grow long, branching filaments that penetrate the ant's exoskeleton and start to invade its body. As the fungus grows, it releases chemicals that alter the ant's behavior, causing it to become disoriented and leave its colony. The fungus continues to grow inside the ant's body, eventually replacing its organs and tissue with a mass of fungal cells. We're not stupid. We know exactly why the Defense Department would want to essentially weaponize this. We do this because we are scientists. And pushing the boundaries of human knowledge in further understanding of the world around us is fundamental to our role. Now fully suited up, Mike entered the first test subject's room, number 4, and activated the cage squeeze function. The cage started to close in on the test subject, squeezing in from the front and back. This process meant Mike could get up and close to the test subject without risk to himself. But just as the cage closed in tight, locking the subject in place, his skin burst apart from multiple areas and sharp dagger-like spores fired out in all directions. Panicking, Mike turned and ran for the door he just came through. I reached out for the emergency lockdown button to prevent him from leaving and hit it a second too late. Mike ran out into the connecting corridor, screaming in pain. Some of the spores had penetrated his suit and were now drilling their way into his body as Mike screamed and clawed at the holes, ripping his hazmat suit while trying to grab them out. I activated the alarms and locked down my door as Mike thrashed about in the corridor. A few minutes later, I heard security come running down the hall and yell at Mike to get down, but he was in too much pain to respond. The security guards continued to yell at Mike, tasers drawn, when Mike suddenly started running at them. Without flinching, both security guards tasered Mike, dropping him onto the floor. Then they slowly approached to restrain him when suddenly Mike's body tore open and fired out more dagger-like spores. Impossible! I yelled at the camera as I watched both guards get hit by the spores. The cordyceps had multiplied and spread within minutes. The guards, now themselves in agonizing pain, ran back through the doors that they had come from and into one of the main lab halls where more than a dozen researchers were working. Watching through the cameras, I saw the researchers panicking and trying to escape via the now locked doors as the two security guards thrashed around. Then, just like Mike, the security guard's skin split open, firing multiple spores around the room. Most of the researchers had now been infected, and those that avoided being struck by the spores weren't so lucky a few minutes later as more spores went flying around the room. Soon, every researcher was infected, screaming and writhing in agony. I stayed in my locked room for hours, watching as the infected slowly stopped moving. One by one, they collapsed to the floor or on tabletops, and I watched in horrified amazement as fungal growth started to sprout from the holes in their skin. I eventually put on a hazard suit, unlocked the door, and left the office, slowly walking towards Mike's still body. By now, he was covered in fungal stalks and mushroom-like growths, and even had one growth right through his eye socket, popping his eyeball out to the side. But that wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing was his other eye, which was fixated on me. It had an expression of sheer terror and agony. He was alive, paralyzed, and appeared to be feeling every horrifying moment as the cordyceps slowly dissolved his internal organs and replaced them with fungal growths. I'm sorry, Mike. I whispered, genuinely upset at his predicament. Mike was a good guy, but I knew I couldn't help him. The cordyceps was devouring his internal organs as he lay there. So I did what any good scientist would do. I carefully took a sample of the growth from his eye socket and a blood sample. I then carefully attached a mobile heart rate monitor to his arm through one of the ripped holes Mike had made earlier and then slowly backed back into the secure room, locked the doors, and awaited my rescue. The data I could get from Mike would no doubt prove invaluable for our next attempt. So here I wait. It has taken longer than I thought to be rescued. It's been about 60 hours since Mike got infected. The bodies are now unrecognizable lumps of fungal growth, and Mike's heart finally stopped registering a pulse around 15 hours ago. Which means he was alive for two whole days after the infection. 
He did have multiple heart attacks during that time, no doubt from the pain of multiple organs turning to slush. But somehow, he was kept alive. I have tried the internal lines multiple times, but no one is answering. It's probably a security protocol I'm unaware of, and I can't see the cameras outside this part of the facility. But I am sure they are just taking extreme precautions. After all, the last thing anyone would want is for this to escape the lab. But I'm sure everything is fine. At least, I hope it is.